Okay, if we can get back together tonight, we'll get into our Bible study. We have been um, talking about, it's all about Jesus, and uh, this is our fourth study. We just, uh, last week, we're talking about uh, the Old Testament and the seven feasts that Jesus Christ is seen in those feasts in, in uh, the Jewish festivals, and so he is everywhere, and so he is... Uh, he is to be worshipped and praised and honored in all that we do. And so we're going to continue that study. We didn't finish it last night. The notes that you have, or we didn't finish it last week, the notes that you have are just from where we left off. It's a continuation. So these are what we had in your notes last week but didn't get to. I just copied those to a new sheet so we'll, you, we can pick it up uh, right from there. And so last week, you know, we began looking at this. And through the Old Testament feasts, we, could, we looked at three of the seven major feasts or annual feasts that the Jews were required to celebrate and to attend to. And all these feasts, folks, point to Jesus Christ in some way. And that's really what we're, we're talking about. It's all about Jesus Christ. And so even back to the feasts and their celebration, though Jesus was not yet born, it was still a focus on the coming Messiah, who he would be. And so they represented uh, him and the celebration would be not necessarily about Jesus at that time, but it was, a, it was a commemoration, and Jesus can be seen in what they did, as we'll show you as we go forward. And so um, they point to Christ. And so last week we talked about Passover. That is, Jesus is the Lamb of God. That was the Passover celebration we talked about. We talked about Jesus seen in unleavened bread. That was um, uh, that, that following seven-day ceremony, that feast, that uh, represented Jesus' crucifixion. And so the, the Passover represented Jesus as the Lamb of God. Unleavened bread represents Jesus being crucified and giving up his life uh, for us. And then the first fruits, that's Nisan 16, the second day after Passover. That was the picturing of Jesus' resurrection from the dead. When they brought those first fruits in, they would offer them to the Lord. Jesus was the first fruits of them that slept. And so we talked about that. So if you just look at this overall, that might be a little bit small for some of you to see back there. Uh, we've got, yeah, it doesn't show. Is that a lot small back there for you guys? We need more front row seats, don't we? All right, so up here at the top, you have the three feasts. This was at the beginning. It forms a clock and starts March, April, May. You got the Feast of Passover, Unleavened Bread, and First Fruits all in the month Nisan. You skip IR and you get to Sivan, and that's the next one. That's Pentecost. We're going to start there tonight. You skip a couple months, and we do the last three down here at the bottom, and that is the Trumpets, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Tabernacles. That make up the seven, really, in two months and one, one other in a third month, but they're combined together as the main feasts in the Jewish calendar year. And so I just wanted you to see that they're kind of one after the other after the other, um, even though you can't see that very well. Um, that's that. Just take take my word for it, okay? <laughs> All right. So turn to turn to John chapter five, if you would please, just for a moment. John chapter five. Jesus is in his earthly ministry, and. Um, his words to the crowd of religious leaders at the feast in Jerusalem were these. He said in John 5, 39, search the scriptures. That's what we're doing today, right? We're doing that tonight. Search the scriptures, for in them you think ye have eternal life. And notice he says there, and they are they which testify of me. The scriptures tell of me. What scriptures is he talking about? Well, the only thing they had then was the Old Testament scriptures. The Old Testament scriptures talk about me. And he's telling the Jewish leaders that, like, hey, you're studied in the law. You should know these things. And, and so he challenged this, them on that. And so the story that brings this up, that's verse 39 in John chapter 5. But if you look, uh, starting in verse 1 of chapter 5, he says this. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. We're talking about the feasts. It doesn't tell us there what feast this was, but most likely, most commentators think it was uh, the feast of, of um, uh, Passover is, is what they're thinking about that. And so he's, he's saying he went up to the feast. Now drop down to verse 5. 
Here's what happened. A certain man was there which had an infirmity 30 years. So now we, we know about this or 30 and 8 years. That's how, that's how long he had it. And so you drop down to verse 8, and Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. He heals this man after it was the one that went down into the water, in the water, someone stirred the water, and he couldn't get down in it. Jesus comes and heals this man after all those years. So everyone could see that he's a, a lame man for 38 years. Jesus comes along on the feast day, or the day after feast day, which is the Sabbath day, and he heals this man on the Sabbath day. Look at verse, uh, let's see. Verse 8, Jesus said unto him, Rise, take up thy bed, and walk. And immediately the man was made whole, and took up his bed, and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Uh-oh, he's making trouble now. Verse 10, The Jews therefore said unto him, That was cured, It is the Sabbath day. It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. He answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. Well, that incensed the Jews. That incensed these religious leaders. How dare you? be able to get up and walk on, on, and, and even though you've been sick for 38 years it's the Sabbath you shouldn't be walking you shouldn't be healed you shouldn't be better on this day having no thought or care for people's lives nor did they care for their souls that was the problem that the, these religious pompous Pharisees had and so the, this crowd by the way on this holy day if it was Passover and the day after it was swelling people were coming from all over the place and and so the crowds were growing, and the people who were around watching Jesus perform this miracle were beginning to see this, and that was making the Jews more angry and upset and jealous because he was gaining a following. And the Bible says there in verse 16, if you look down, it says, Therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. How dare they break the Sabbath? And on a whole holy day after Passover, this was wrong to do. And so they're calling him out on that. And so as we get through the, the, you know, the, the dialogue here, Jesus begins this long teaching to these religious leaders in the, on, around the temple area. And uh, he's talking about who he is and why he has come. And so he, uh, he he's he's in this celebration, and in fact, they don't even realize it, but the celebration of Passover is about Jesus. He is the Passover lamb, and they miss it completely. Though he didn't yet go to the cross, Jesus knew, hey, I'm the very focal point that you should be thinking about, and you're wanting to put me to death. You're having exactly the opposite thing that you should. And so because he healed on the Sabbath, he was mocking their Passover in their view and claimed that God was his father, or later here in the text, um, they were totally offended and, uh, and uh, incensed at him. And so they should have been worshiping him, watching the miracles, seeing his power, seeing his graciousness, looking at the time clock when Jesus would have come and knowing that, hey, this very well could be the Messiah. And yet that was not the case. And so he comes down to verse 39 after talking to them about all these things, about who he was coming from God. He says, verse 39, Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. You're condemning me for who I am. I want you to go back and study the scriptures again to see that I am the very Messiah. You shouldn't be condemning me. It, there should be worship here. And so that's what's going on in, in this thing. It's happening on a Sabbath and then a holy day. And they're misrepresenting everything. So by way of review of last week, if you remember, we were talking about Leviticus 23, and we learned the, who these feasts actually belong to. Leviticus chapter 23 says, God says they're my feasts. They're not man's feasts. They're not the Jews' feasts. They're not anybody's feasts. They're God's feasts. And he's the one who wanted the Jews to commemorate them. And so by way of review, again, what does... God called these festivals or special days feasts, which means a solemn assembly and an appointed time or season, a festival. It's a celebration. It's an assembly for a religious purpose. He also calls them back in, in Leviticus 23, a holy convocation. That simply means a calling out of a meeting for holy purposes. And so feasts and convocations, that's what we talked about last week. Last week's. And so they were established, folks, to commemorate 
special events that God did in Jewish life. He wanted his people to remember him and to give him honor. And so they also pointed to the promised Messiah who would come as well and see that picture of him in the Old Testament. And so he, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is the focal point of all seven of these feasts. He fulfilled the spring feasts, the ones we're talking about now on that calendar, the, the first three, and then he would fulfill, and we're going to talk about the fourth, and he would fulfill actually all four. We're going to talk about the fourth one today. In the spring, then the ones that, down here at the bottom that we saw, those are the final three. They're going to be happening in the fall, September, October time frame. They have not yet been fulfilled. They are going to be fill, fulfilled yet in the future, according to the, the timetable here. And so let's talk about some of those. Let's get into um, the Feast of Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. We have to go back now to Leviticus chapter 23, and we're not going to read all of the detail of each of these. We just don't have time to do that. But it's in Leviticus chapter 23, all, all these feasts. And um, this particular one here, the Feast of Pentecost, is in, starts in verse uh, 14. It says, Ye shall eat neither bread, nor parched corn, nor green ears, until the selfsame day that you have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be for a statute forever through your generations in all your dwellings. Verse 15, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Let's ask the Lord to bless our time as we get into this study. Father God, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for the truth of it. Lord, I pray that you would help me to deliver that truth clearly and succinctly. And I pray that, Lord, it would not be just information, but it would be um, help to us to greater appreciate the power of your word, uh, your love for us, and that you have a plan ever since the beginning to redeem mankind and to send your son Jesus to die for us. Thank you for his life. Thank you for his death. Thank you for his resurrection. Thank you that we can worship him even tonight. Bless our time together in Jesus' name. Amen. And so Pentecost, folks, occurred seven weeks plus one day. That's the 50 days after the first day of unleavened bread on the sixth day of Sivan, which would have been May or June. So now we've been through the first three feasts. Now we're getting into that fourth feast. That moves us to June. So uh, the April, May is now done. March, April, I should say, is now done. We're now at that May uh, slide, if you will, or May time. So what does that look like? Uh, let's see there. The Feast of Pentecost. Pentecost, as you, or I'm sorry, yeah, Pentecost was going to happen 50 days after Passover and uh, the unleavened bread and first fruits. And so it would be a Friday, Passover would be. The next day would be a Sabbath, Sabbath day. That was Saturday. That was the beginning of unleavened bread. And then the next day after that, that was Sunday. That was the Feast of first fruits, And that was also the day that they started counting the seven weeks to Pentecost. So seven weeks after the day of uh, the, the Sabbath day, it was a Sunday. That was first fruits. Seven weeks exactly after that would be Pentecost. What's interesting is that um, it's seven days, Pentecost was uh, seven days after first fruits. First fruits was saying, okay, this is where we're offering our grain to the Lord, the first fruits of them that slept, the first fruits from the field. Jesus resurrected on a Sunday. And so seven weeks after that was celebrating Pentecost. It was the new worship that we have in the New Testament celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That would become the new day as opposed to the Sabbath worship. It would become Sunday, um, seven weeks after what it used to be, the Sabbath from the Old Testament. And so that was forthcoming. Jesus would rise on that day, a you know, Sunday, and we would celebrate that seven, seven weeks after um, unleavened bread. And so what does it do? It commemorates the offering of the new grain of the summer, summer wheat harvest. The grain is brought into the, into, the, into the offering, and they offer that to the Lord as a representative of what's happening next. After that, it was just simply known as a pil pilgrim festival. 
there was three of those in the seven that were spe specifically mentioned that men had to make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem on these three feasts. One of those was this feast of unleavened bread. And so um, it was the second of the three pilgrim festivals that the Jewish males were required to physically attend each year. Unleavened bread, I'm sorry, was the first one. This is the second. The third one would be tabernacles. So from no matter where the men of Israel were, if they were scattered all around the world, they had to make their pilgrimage back to Jerusalem to keep this particular feast. And so it was one of the three. So people would gather in great numbers, again, as I said earlier, at certain ones of these feasts, and this was one of them. What does it actually show? It shows joy and thankfulness for the Lord's blessing of the harvest. His blessing of the harvest. Now, Peter, the Apostle Peter, way back in, or, or way forward, if you will, in Acts chapter 2, he made reference to Joel, back to Joel chapter 2, about the fulfillment of prophecy when God would pour out his spirit on mankind when he was preaching to this large Jewish crowd that had gathered and come in from all over the place. It was on the day of Pentecost. And so in Acts chapter 2, Peter is, is going to sort of tie this back, this event, back to Pentecost and, and back to Joel's prophecy. And let me just read that to you in, in uh, chapter 2 and verse 14 of Acts. It says, But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, You men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by Joel the prophet. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. This was on the day of Pentecost in the New Testament. And we know Pentecost is the day that, that the Holy Spirit came down from heaven in cloven tongues of fire and began to rest on the disciples and other believers, showing that the Holy Spirit, God was pouring out his spirit on mankind. And so Peter is referencing this Pentecost back to the, to the, uh, the, the, the uh, prophecy of Joel about this whole thing. And so um, the question arises as to why Peter, why Peter would make the association of a Jewish agricultural feast. It was the Feast of Pentecost. It commemorated God's blessing of grain in the Old Testament on his people. Why would he associate that agricultural blessing with the, with the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament here after Jesus' resurrection? Well, the, the solution, and we're not going to turn all there, but in Joel chapter 2, that's what Peter is quoting that I just read to you. And so what happened back in Joel's day, there was a terrible um, blight of locusts. It was a plague and in Joel's day, and it left Israel destitute. It wiped out all the crops. On top of that, there was a terrible drought, and it wiped out a lot of the cattle. And so they didn't have food, and it ravaged the whole area and compounded uh, everything between blight and drought. It killed off much of what Israel had in the land. And yet Joel called for a solemn assembly to return to the Lord that God would bring a bountiful a blessing back to the land, which God did. And Peter now, you know, hundreds of years later is saying, just as God did that on an agricultural basis with our people way back then, on a spiritual level, God is going to pour out his spirit on us, his followers, to empower us to live for Christ at an even greater level. And so that's what Peter was tying together here at this Feast of Pentecost. So, so how, does, how do we see Jesus then in the Feast of Pentecost? Well, it's something like this. Just as the new harvest brought joy and blessing to God's people from the field, the Holy Spirit was given by the Lord to his people on Pentecost to empower them 
for ministry and bring spiritual blessing to their lives by his indwelling presence. That was the tie-in. Now we have the Holy Spirit living in us, not just something from the field that we can be thankful to God for, but now God's going to give us his spirit that indwells us. That never happened before that time. As you know, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came and went from people, but in the New Testament, he permanently indwells us. And so that's what Joel was proclaiming as part of the agricultural healing, that God's spirit would heal mankind as well. Jesus is seen in that the pouring out of his spirit was coming upon mankind. And so Peter is making that connection with giving of the spirit on Pentecost to the agricultural blessing of God in Joel's day. Christ was giving his Holy Spirit to his people. And so that, that's a, a, a strong connection there between the two. And so it's important that we see that. Next, it marked the beginning, Pentecost did, of the church age or the age of grace that allowed man to have personal fellowship with the Lord. That began, as we many say, that began the church age. Now, we believe as Baptists that, that the church really got started with Jesus and his disciples. He called the disciples out, and they began to meet together, and, and, and uh, he was giving his word. But that was uh, the root of the church. And yet that began, began to grow, and finally by Pentecost, after Jesus leaves, now the, the Holy Spirit comes, and that solidifies this body, the church to go forward from there. And so just uh, it's important that we understand that part. And so no longer, folks, did we need a mediator to represent us, a priest to represent us when we go to God. Because now we are believer priests. We have his spirit living in us. Jesus opened the way for us, us to have direct access to God. And so Hebrews chapter 10 says this. I think that's in your notes. Uh, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh, he opened up the way for us to come directly into the throne room of God. That was a new way of coming. We did not need to have a mediator. All that is kind of, kind of commemorated through what was going on in Pentecost. Let's keep going. You've got next the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets. That's found back in Leviticus chapter 23 again. It's also in Numbers chapter 29. And again, we don't have time to read through all the details. But what did the Feast of Trumpets trumpets, uh, commemorate? Well, it commemorated the future regathering of God's people at the beginning of the new civil year. And I say that the new civil year. Here's what happened. During the Babylonian captivity... The rabbis adopted another calendar year. That was a civil calendar year. You had the Jewish calendar year. Now there was going to be a civil calendar year on the Feast of Trumpets. What they would do to commemorate that new year, by the way, that started in September. That was their new year. And on this day, the shofar, you know, that ram's horn would be blown 100 times. And that special sound is considered to be what they believe was the prayer without words. The blowing of that horn incessantly for 100 times was the prayer to God without words according to the tradition of the Jews. It was a cry of the heart. It was the sound of repentance. That's what the Jews made it to be, and that's what they believed it to be. So what it does, it occurs in the Jewish civil new year on the first day of Tishri, that's September, October, And we know that, as you've seen this before, right? It's commonly called Rosh Hashanah, right? You've heard that. Rosh Hashanah, which means head of the year. That's what that terminology means. Israel was starting off technically their new Jewish civil year. So they would go around saying Happy New Year as Jews to one another around this date and around this time. And so it begins, this particular Feast of Trumpets begins 10 days Again, they like these feasts, don't they? Like, they like extended parties here, don't they? So it begins 10 days of repentance. This is more of a solemn one. And confession that will culminate with Yom Kippur. That's going to be 10 days after the trumpets. Yom Kippur, Yom the day. Kippur, the day of atonement on the final day of trumpets. And so that's going to lead us right into the very next um, the very next feast, but 
just to give you a little bit more information, what about what this was? So, first of all, um, these days are considered high holy days to the Jews. Yom Kippur is the, is the holiest day of the year, the Day of Atonement. And so these trumpets leading up to that was preparing them for this, this solemn, solemn day. And so God, as king, is faithful to remember his covenant promises to his people. And God, as judge, is a righteous and a just God. And so the people were to confess their sin in repentance and to be broken over them. They're preparing for that for the day of Yom Kippur, even through this 10 day of repentance and confession through the Feast of Trumpets. They're even preparing their hearts to get to the high holy day of the Day of Atonement. It's reconciliation and forgiveness that are strongly encouraged since one must make things right with others before they are right with God. Even the Jews believed that back then. And so this Feast of the Lord is primarily a joyful one. How do we mean? Well, it's like our new year. We, we celebrate that, although around here we have pork and sauerkraut. Is that right? Mashed potatoes. It's a little bit different. What they did, it was apples dipped in honey. And people were wished a sweet new year. Greetings abounding, concerns uh, wanting one another to be their names. In essence, they would say, we want our names written in God's book of life. Now, we think about Christians and our Lamb's book of life, but for the Jews, the book of life was not the book of life that we understand. Their book of life was an annual thing, and it was based upon their works. Lord, would you give us a good year? Would you bring bounty and blessing to us? Would you, would you help us to be able to do our very best with our lives and so that your, your blessing will be upon us because of how well we do? And would you write us in your book of blessings for this next year? That's what they were doing on this New Year celebration. It was not like we think about the Lamb's Book of Life when we get saved. Your names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. This was not the Lamb's book of life. This was just God's book of life, and they just saw it as a need to do good works. And at the next year, they'd come back and say, God, would you put us in your book again? It was all based upon their works. It was not at all based upon the grace of God or the, or the, the grace of Jesus Christ now in the New Testament. It was all about their bounty and blessing in this world. And so they have little knowledge most traditional Jews today have little knowledge about the book of life to begin with. They hope that based on their repentance and good deeds, God has written their name in his book for a good year until next year. And so as believers, folks, we know, we know that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life when we receive Christ as Savior forever and ever. Amen? And that's what gets us to heaven having a belief in Jesus Christ that when he died on the cross and rose from the grave, we say by faith, Lord Jesus, I want you to come into my life, live in me, give me eternal life. Our, his Holy Spirit comes to indwell us because if we have not the Spirit of Christ, we have none of his. His Spirit comes, lives in us. God looks down from heaven and says, I see my Spirit living in you. I declare you righteous. You're put in my Lamb's book of life, never to be erased. No matter what we do, we're in the Lamb's book of life. It's permanent salvation. Glory to God. Amen? Amen? That's not what the Jews saw at all. It was total confusion to what we understand today. And so these traditional Jews, they, um, they reject the idea of oh, a spirit coming to live inside of us, and they reject Jesus as Messiah and the New Testament and God's holy word. They reject all of it. And so that's sad for them. But, but for us, seeing Jesus in the trumpet, the, the Feast of Trumpets, is this. The Feast of Trumpets is linked with the rapture of the church when Christ returns for his bride. The rapture spoken of in 1 Thessalonians 4. Most of us are familiar with this passage. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel. And there it is, the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. In the same way, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. 
in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. There's that trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. It's a spiritual transformation. It's life transformation. Our body goes to heaven if we're still living, and it gets changed into a new body. That's what we have to look forward to, folks. That is great stuff for us to understand. And so believers, as a result of that, are to be ready and watching. We must be spiritually prepared to meet the Lord so that repentance and confession of sin to comply with his righteous judgment is there in our hearts. And so, can I say to you today, we all understand the time of the Lord's return is getting close, is it not? It's getting close. And therefore, I want to encourage all of us, don't just sort of put this aside. Oh, you know, Jesus might come. He might not. I'm just, you know, I'm just going to be waiting around. But no, no, no. He says, I want you, my faithful servants, I want you watching. I want you ready. And I want you to be doing my work. Because like the, like the, the maids who had their lights trimmed and they were ready, but the others were not, Jesus comes in an hour, as I think, not. And the lights are dimmed and dark. They're not watching. So many Christians today are not watching. They're not thinking about the Lord's return. Folks, we need to be thinking about the Lord's return. We need to be talking about the Lord's return. It's coming soon, and we want to be actively doing God's work, right? So let's be doing that. That's why it's important that we talk about those things. Now, how, how do we prepare? Well, we simply live a holy life. And we tell others about Christ, and we're here. We don't break fellowship with one another. We're here as the body of, uh, as the body of Christ meeting together, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but so much the more as we see the day approaching, we're meeting in this corporate body of Christ. And so, so glad you're out tonight to get the word of God. And it is that repentance. It is that confession. It's keeping short accounts with God. It's living for God. Keeping short accounts with God in our day-to-day -day sins doesn't get us to heaven. Christ gets us to heaven, but he wants us to live a holy life. That means keeping short accounts with God by confessing those day-to-day -day sins and staying right with him. That's how we show honor to him in that. And so he wants us to be ready and watching and prepared. That's the Feast of Trumpets. Let's go with next, the Day of Atonement. This is the Yom Kippur. Now, at the end of Feast of Trumpets, you have this highest holy day in the Jewish calendar and what does that commemorate? We call it Yom Kippur. They call it Yom Kippur. It is. It commemorates the day when the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies in the Jewish tabernacle to offer a sacrificial offering. It's either a bull or a goat for the sins of the people. That's what it commemorates. It was the holiest day of the Jewish calendar year because it restored the relationship of a holy God with a sinful people. So it is perhaps, of all these feasts, it's probably perhaps the only day in which sin receives a major focus. They're preparing for it in the uh, Feast of Trumpets leading up to it with repentance. But it was generally a happy celebration. Here at, the, here at uh, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, they were to be making their long lists of sins, both intentional and unintentional, and they're recited in the synagogues and throughout the world. The high priest would first have to cleanse himself with water, Maybe some of you have heard this before, but let me just give you the rundown of what happens here. The high priest would have to cleanse himself with water, then put on his holy priestly garments. This was to stand before Almighty God in the Old Testament. Folks, Jesus has abolished all of this because we stand in the righteousness of Christ today. We don't need any of this today. Because we are robed in the righteousness of Christ, we can come right into the throne room of God because of the righteousness of Christ found in us. But the priest, representing the people... He would then offer a burnt offering and a sin offering for himself and sin offering for the people. He would put the blood on the horns of the altar in the holy place to sanctify it. He would put blood on his right ear, on his right thumb, and on his right big toe, symbolic of his whole body being con uh, covered so he could enter the presence of the Lord in the Holy of Holies behind the veil. He would then take the censer of burnt coals and a handful of incense behind the veil in the Holy of Holies. Leviticus 16 tells us this. The cloud of smoke would cover the mercy seat as he would throw some of that incense on the, the fire. The, the, the smoke would come up. That would cover the mercy seat so that this man would not die. There was a covering to keep him from experiencing all the righteousness of God on the Holy of Holies right there. 
And so he would then dip his finger in the blood of the bullock and sprinkle it upon the mercy seat seven times. After that, he would take a goat chosen by Lot and kill it for a sin offering. And he would take the blood into the Holy of Holies. And the same thing with the goat's blood, he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat again. Let's keep going. He would then take the live goat and lay both of its legs on the head of the scapegoat. So one goat is selected to be killed. The other is selected to be let free. So while he's there, he would put his hands on the goat and he would pray over the goat all the sins of the people. How long would that prayer be? <laughs> he's praying over all the sins of the people. And so with both of his hands, and he would confess over him all their sins of the entire nation at that one moment on the high and holy day in that holy place. They would then give the live goat, it says, to a fit man, someone who is in good shape, because he's going to walk way out in the wilderness. And he's going to leave that goat go in the wilderness so that no one could find him. That was the scapegoat. He goes free by bearing the sins. The, 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 the goat that was killed bore the sins, but this one prayed over him, but he takes the sin and gets it out. He escapes. And so... Um, Israel's sins were then covered. Folks, they were not forgiven. They were just covered. Because we know the blood of goats and bulls can no wise wash away sins. After doing all that, that just covered over Israel's sins until the time Jesus Messiah would come and ultimately wash away our sins and make us right before God. And so they were not forgiven but covered so God could have a relationship with his people. They then burnt the remains of the bull and the goat used for the sin offering, and they burned them outside the camp. What a, what a formal process to go through. Thank the Lord we don't have to go through that every day. Priest Wendell doing all these things, High Priest Wendell doing all these things for us, and, and the uh, associate priests, Eifert and Colton and others, having to do all the other things with these animals. Can you imagine? That's a bloody job. I would not like that. And thank the Lord, Jesus shed his blood one time for us, so we don't have to do that anymore. We don't have to do that anymore. What an awesome thing. So Jesus then, Jesus, seeing this, he's the sacrificial lamb that made atonement for the sins of mankind, folks, once and for all. Once and for all, John 1, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says this, By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the blood of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, you want to underline this in your Bible here, it's, it's, it's uh, Hebrews 10, uh, 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins, forever sat down on the right hand of God. An ultimate sacrifice that Jesus made for us. May we never get over it, right class? May we never, ever get over it. So when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and he entered the Holy of Holies in heaven to offer eternal redemption for us. That we might have a way to God. What does this offering, or what does this, um, this feast picture, the Day of Atonement? It's really the second coming of Jesus Christ, where he is going to ultimately do away with his enemies and sin and uh, set up his millennial kingdom. And so that's a picture of that for us. The last one here, we have five minutes to cover it, and that is the Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. That's also found in Leviticus 23. They go one after the other, so you can go back and read through these. The Feast of Tabernacles or Booths. So when you think about a tabernacle, you think about a big place, but it really wasn't a big worshipful place or like a synagogue. They were booths. They were small tents. They were small places where each Jew would make up their own little place to dwell in. And so let me explain that. So what does the tabernacles commemorate? It commemorates the Israelites dwelling in temporary shelters, if you will, after leaving Egypt. They wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And so this is a modern day sort of what one of those booths would look like. 
it wasn't that ornate back then because they just put up wood sticks and they cover them over with different um, branches of different tree limbs. But they were required to build these things, and for seven days they would live outside in these crude shelters, if you will. So Israel was required to abandon the comfort of their own home and for one week to live in a coarse, flimsy hut to remember how they lived for 40 years in wandering in the wilderness. God never wanted his people to remember, look, I delivered you from Egypt out of bondage. And yes, you had to wander in the wilderness because you rejected me. You had to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and live in tents and live in booths for all that time. And so they were to remember that God delivered them from their lowly living to dwell ultimately in comfort and blessing. They were not to hoard or to take for granted God's great provision for them. And so living as a nation one week also helped them to recall, hey, we were one as a nation. Two million of us were together doing all this at the same time. And it commemorated their unity, their community as a group of people. God wanted them to remember that once a year by celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles. So it was a national day of unity that they experienced during the time of the Exodus. And God said, I don't want you ever to forget that. It was also an eight-day festival, seven days, and on the eighth day, um, something happened. Starting on the 15th day of the seventh month, that's Tishri. That was right after, as we just talked about, the other two trumpets, and then we have atonement. A few days later, this started, so it was almost back to back to back and continued through the 22nd. So it was seven days. On the eighth day, they would take it down. And so um, these tabernacles, let me just, before I get to that, these tabernacles were made, supposedly meant to let them sort of feel the weather, to feel the, the ill effects of the discomfort of living in them, to help them see, you don't do that anymore. Your life is way better than it used to be. And folks, we might look at our own life and say, what was life like when we were younger? Is life better today than it was when we were younger? Has God blessed us? Has God given us so much more? Let's not take it for granted. God has given us so much to be thankful for. So third, this was a, um, let me just go ahead one more. It was the third pilgrimage feast that Jewish men had to make annually. So now all the Jews had to come back. And if you imagine walking hundreds of miles from wherever you were coming from back to Jerusalem, only to set up this crude little hut and live there for seven days. That wasn't the most fun thing to do for them but they showed their dedication to the Lord. By the way, what I was going to show you here, during the Feast of Tabernacles, they were to, every day of the seven days, and on the eighth day even, these are the types of animals and the number of animals they were supposed to sacrifice. They were supposed to sacrifice 13 bullocks, two rams, 14 lambs, and one goat on day one. On day two, they would just decrease the number of bullocks, and so it declined by one animal every day. For a total of, at the end of the eighth day, you got to one bullock, one ram, seven lambs, and one goat. So if you look across the bottom, they had to sacrifice 199 animals in order, and it was burnt offering, it was a sin offering, it was a grain offering and a drink offering that they poured over the grain offering. There was this formal offerings that were going on while they're going through this seven-day procedure in tabernacles. And so it was rather an involved event. And so it showed God's care and protection of them during their 40-year wilderness wanderings. Now, how do we see Jesus in this one as we prepare to close here? How do, we, how do we see Jesus in tabernacles? So when Jesus attended the Feast of Tabernacles on the last day of the feast, he said, if any man thirst, this was in the New Testament in John chapter 7, on the Feast of Tabernacles, he said, Tabernacles, he said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and to drink. By that statement, folks, Jesus was claiming to be the Messiah. John tells us that some believed on him right there and others doubted because they knew that part of the sacrifice, that drink offering, Jesus was part of that drink offering. He's saying, I am the water of life. 
If you thirst, come to me. I'll give you a drink. It was represented in one of the offerings that was made at this Feast of Tabernacles. Well, the next morning, while the torches were still burning, uh, let's see, while the torches were still burning, Jesus said, I am the light of the world because they lived by torches. They would light the torches around and they would, they would put it around the temple wall in Jerusalem and that would shed light out from there and so representing, hey, Israel is sort of the light to the nations. While that's burning, Jesus is there saying, I am the light of the world. If you walk in darkness, come to me and you have a great light. And so he was saying, in essence, I am the drink. If you're thirsty, I am the light if you're in darkness. And so the feast represents the final grain harvest in the Jewish year. That is also a picture of Jesus allowing the nations to enjoy his blessings in the millennial kingdom. And that's what this final feast represents. It's Jesus who's going to come and he's going to set up his kingdom and we are not going to be dwelling in, in small huts anymore and, and, and little shelters. He's going to give us the blessing of his millennial kingdom. And so in Zechariah chapter 14, it says this, And it shall come to pass that every one that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the feast of tabernacles. That was God's requirement. It was characterized by many animals being sacrificed for numerous holy offerings to the Lord at great expense. There were burnt offerings, sin offerings, meat offerings, peace offerings, drink offerings, all those 199 things that, that in essence, God was saying, don't forget about me. Don't forget about me. And that's what all these feasts are about. Don't forget about me. Remember me in the Jewish feasts. People of God, you have my spirit dwelling in you in the New Testament. Remember to worship me. Remember to confess your sin. Remember to keep short accounts with me and with one another. And worship me in spirit and in truth. So there's the, here's the practical lesson as we close. What's in it for all of us? What, what do all these feasts mean for us practically? Well, folks, let's let the writings of the Old Testament build your faith in the reality of Jesus Christ as the Son of God and as our Savior. He was written about in the Old Testament. We can see that today. And so practically, let's do this. Determine to live your life in obedience to him as simply a thank you note for what he's done for us, right? Lord, thank you for going through all of my pain and all of my suffering. Thank you for taking all of my burdens, all these things, my life, I want to be a thank you note to say thank you for your grace and goodness in my life. Let's not take these things for granted. Let's live to please and honor and serve Christ till he comes. And by the way, let's keep watching because he's coming soon. He's coming soon. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for uh, this study tonight. Thank you for each one who is out. There's a lot of twists and turns in all this information. Thank you for the attentiveness of those, Lord, who can be here. And Father, as we take in this information, we can see you in the Old Testament. We can see you in the New Testament. Lord, help us to draw only closer to you as we gain more information about you. Might we be in awe 